A lot of people like to post about how Star Trek is communism. It's literally not, but they don't care because they're ideologically driven. I mean, whatever Star Trek is, it doesn't really fit the definitions that we have historically. It's just a sci-fi world of peace on Earth, you know, not in outer space, but they have replicator technology and they can, their ships anti-grav and all that stuff. And they're like, see, that's communism. I'm like, dude, it's nothing. It's Star Trek. It's a magical universe of fiction. If we want to get to that point, it's not going to be through government authoritarianism and a command economy. It's going to be through smart people working really, really hard and people in general coming together to find new ways to do new things. And unfortunately, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Ryan Long, he's the comedian, has this new segment out. Did you, you guys see this? I don't know. And he's at the church. The Church yeah. of Woke. And he basically is dressed like a priest talking about how their new religion is, is wokeness. And essentially, humorously, drawing parallels between oppressive religious doctrine and critical theory. That's the freakiest thing to me, that you've got people on the left weaponizing critical theory, which is a moral authoritarian dogma, which is going to restrict our ability to actually develop new technology and do new things. One of the biggest problems I've always had with the left, because I used to do fundraising for nonprofits. One of them, uh, I worked for several environmental nonprofits. And I immediately started researching, okay, climate change is a problem, right? Global warming is a problem, carbon emissions, all that stuff. Okay, what's our best solution? And I came across nuclear energy. It has zero emissions, and it has a massive energy return on energy invested. Thorium reactors. Yeah, I've heard thorium about thorium. Thorium salts, right? Yeah. So they, like, they're very safe. They don't melt down. It's liquid, right? It's a liquid reactor? Yeah, it's a liquid core reactor. There's a, it's, it's safer because it, it doesn't, you can use the fuel indefinitely. It doesn't have spent fuel rods, so there's not the waste problem like that other fuels have, like we have at Yucca Mountain with uh, all the reactor right, right. fuel. But so, so here I am, and it's these exact environmental organizations saying no to nuclear energy. And I didn't know why. I said, well, it's, it's zero emission, and this new technology is safe. And they're like, nuclear is bad. It's bad for the planet. It's the same reason they took, like, an NR MRI machine, the same way I talked about Edward Mills personally, he invented NMRI, nuclear magnetic resonance. So what they use in an, in an NMRI machine, an MRI machine, is called an NR MRI machine because they took the N out. It's actually a nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machine. But they removed the word nuclear because people hear, hear that word, and it's like wow. they don't understand it. Really? But all of this is just, nu it's just, it's just the nucleus yeah. of an atom. It doesn't mean that it's, it's nuclear... Uh, fission or that it's nuclear active decay or radiation it doesn't mean any of nuclear that. doesn't mean radiation it doesn't so well, do we need do we need like a uh atlas shrug type scenario where all the wealthy industrialists flee to a secret location to to be free from the oppressive government yes we've what had a discussion place, what, what's called? i think we're all on board with that Making yes. a ranch where we can build and saucers. Kapistan? And Capistan? Yes, and, and isn't it kind of sad that, that our resources, our money is being spent for destruction rather than building, rather than actually construction? If you look at where the majority of the scientific community, where you look at the majority of the money that goes into them, it, it goes into what? Weapons. Weapons. Yes. Not, of course, helping, creating, solving a lot of the problems that we all face. And we have to keep all of it, the technology secret. So we have Everything has to be not open sourced. Everything has to be kept for power purposes and ego and uh you know it's it's when we look at it from the, the bigger picture it's absolutely sad and pathetic they got to be 30 years ahead um with what we have publicly yeah. you know they're 30 years advanced in some ways of what's the classified stuff that's out there and they're holding that and withholding it and using it to make weapons and they, they want to keep the it, the whole goal of this is to you know the military industrial banking intelligence petroleum complex and what I, is what i call it and it's basically this organization that uh, of rich people that want to maintain power and control and any uh, under any terms possible they don't and, and that includes you know keeping these technologies under wraps and only for them and for their purposes and there, stuff, so there are a few things in this world that uh, uh that can break my heart as tremendously as two specific historical incidents. The first is the burning of the Library of Alexandria. Ugh. What a horror story mm -hmm. for human history, man. That, that one just Ugh. right through the heart, huh? One, the second, though, is the quote from Werner von Braun, the, you know, what is he, the godfather of rocketry, essentially. And he helped make a bunch of crazy weapons, rocket weapons, for uh, World War II Germany. Mm. And he has a very famous quote. Let me read a little bit. They say, when the first V2 hit London, Von Braun remarked to his colleagues, the rocket worked perfectly, except for landing on the wrong planet. That's so wow. sad, man. That, that, that's, that, that's just a this, punch in the gut. This is a lot of good quotes. This is a guy who said, I want to travel the stars. 
I want to land on other planets and rockets can can do this for us. Dude. And then a psychopath took something so beautiful and turned it into a weapon of mass this, destruction. All I want is fusion. I want working fusion power. I know it's here. We have cold fusion, but yes. it's going to create a weapon. It is. And it's going to end up being used to destroy a lot of humans. If it, but what could they if do with it's a fusion created. reactor? If everyone had one, I don't know, focus the energy into a city. So about cold fusion, uh, Peter Hagelstein is a researcher at, at MIT. Um, I went to a cold fusion course that they had an open IAP course where you could just basically anyone from the public can go there and go to MIT and take a course on cold fusion for a week. And um, there was all these professors and all these students there and that just came to show up for the course. So I, I of course, went because I, I live in you know, I live close enough to Boston. I, I drove in every day. I actually stayed at my, my brother's lives in Boston. So I stayed at his house. And uh, what, what, explain to us fusion and cold fusion. Dude, so basically the idea is that, you know, in regular fusion, fusion happens in a star. We have the biggest fusion reactor in the sky. We're trying to, we're, we're wasting tons of money on hot fusion, trying to build these tokamak reactors and, and these fusion reactors here on, you know, or to, to what mimic is what it? happens What does it do? Like, what is the sun doing? It's literally what's called, you know, breaking the Coulomb barrier. It's pushing through gravity and other forces. It's pushing these things so close together that they get so close that through quantum like tunneling, they think that, that they're in the same place and they actually fuse. Um, so like a hydrogen would come together and make a helium or something yeah, like that? Two hydrogens will come together. The, the protons will add and will create two protons in the nucleus. They start hugging each other and then, then it creates the next heavy element and then the next heavier element up. And, and how does that make energy for us? What does it do? It gets hot? So there's a mass difference between the nucleus and, uh, and there's a mass conversion. So some of that mass is down converted and then the mass, the leftover mass is actually energy through equals MC squared and that we can extract that extra energy that that's left over through after the fusion reaction. Oh. So, um, so what do we do? We like, we end up with what, like it eventually turns to gold. So it will, yeah, it will actually in stars, they, uh, Carl Sagan is a good a book on this, the cosmos. If you ever read cosmos by Carl Sagan, he um, talks about this. There's a documentary on it too, um, where he basically breaks down what stars do. We're all, we're all star stuff. We're all made out of stardust and everything that all the atoms in my body and your body and all the atoms that are here on this planet were created in supernovas through uh, nuclear fission. I mean, nuclear fusion in stars over uh, billions of years. And when they basically create the heliums fuse, they create he helium. Then the helium fuses with another hydrogen and creates lithium, the next heaviest element, and it keeps going up and going up and going lithium up. Lithium solid, the, solid metal. It's a solid metal, yeah. It's actually. Wow. So when helium is this invisible gas, combines another invisible gas, you'll get a physical piece of metal. Yes. That's cool. Um, so there's different theories on what matter is and how matter is constructed and how matter is made. And um, of course, you know, the alchemists tried to do you know, fusion in their laboratories to turn mercury and lead into gold, right? And um, the idea is that, you know, if we can understand nuclear science, then we can create ways to trick, you know, these atoms into doing these things. So, so, so what is cold fusion then? That's like, I hear that's like the holy grail of energy. Right, it is. It was when it came out with Pons and Fleischmann, these two uh, award-winning electrochemists discovered this effect at, um, you know, I, I think it was Brigham and Young University um, where they discovered this uh, in Utah. And um, they weren't sure what to do with the effect that they discovered. They went to people in their department to try and, you know, what do we do? Because, like, we have a new breakthrough energy source, potentially. We could get shot by the oil companies. Like, how do we get this out? And one of the guys at the department was actually a guy named Stephen Jones. I know him. <laughs> I spent a long flight from uh, L.A. to uh, Australia with him, sitting next to him. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah, I've met him before too. Yeah. He's he's an interesting guy. He's he's got a lot of papers on muon catalyzed fusion, and he's got a lot of a lot of interesting ideas and stuff. But, but he, the, he yeah. So cold fusion. Cold fusion is the one. That he's that's the whole history of it. But what it, essentially they recoined the term because it, this press conference blew up in their face. They had a bunch of Caltech and MIT guys come in and say like, oh, look, this doesn't exist. MIT oh, cool. basically wrote the obituary. They wrote an obituary for cold fusion before they had the data and the results back from their lab. But, but real, real quick, can you explain what cold fusion is? It's now called lattice assisted nuclear reaction um, because what they, uh, they know is happening is that inside of a lattice of a metal, um, these atoms are able to behave differently than they behave inside, you know, a star or inside the surface of the sun where they're fusing. So inside of a metal, you can saturate um, metal. Like the, what they do is they saturate palladium with tons of deuterium. The deuterium is like heavy water. It's like you take hydrogen has two isotopes. If you add take one hydrogen is just a proton. So if I add a neutron to that, it makes it heavy hydrogen. That's called deuterium. If I add two protons to that, it's even heavier two hydrogen. Two neutrons. Two neutrons, and that's called tritium, right? So 
what they do is they take deuterium and they pump a ton of it into this palladium lattice until they get a saturation of over 90%. And then when they hit that, that saturation point, which they proved the Caltech and MIT replication experiments never got up to that level where they would have even seen an effect in their labs. But numerous other labs have done this over the past you know, 30 years since this and have shown positive results. And there's an international collaboration of scientists still working on cold fusion and still researching this. I got a question about well, this. So, so we, got, we got to keep going on this. Yeah, if I it wanna, didn't exist, I clarify it would be dead. Something. So you put deuterium, which is basically hydrogen with an added neutron. So it's heavier than regular hydrogen. Yes. You put it in a lattice of palladium. Yes. And then you, they, because it's heavier, they don't like bounce past each other. They have more of a tendency to, to nail you, each other when they... But what do you do? Do you vibrate the palladium to get them to, to fuse? Well, they found that vibrating the palladium or shooting it with a laser and what something called super waves where they have, um, you know, multiple frequencies added on top of the same wave. Uh, when they hit them with these sort of super frequencies uh, called super waves and the, uh, or do laser assisted lattice assisted nuclear reaction, that it increases the effect. So there is some sort of what we believe is going on is that there's some sort of entanglement, some sort of coupling between the atoms inside this lattice when you get a high enough concentration and get enough of them packed in. And that allows for fusion to take place. Not only does it allow for it to take place, but it also allows for the, the, um, the gamma, gammas that should be produced in these reactions. That was one of the arguments that, ga that this, these reactions should have produced gamma rays that should have killed these scientists if they were actually producing fusion in the laboratory. But they've shown through um, Moss Bauer effect and Bremsstrahlung radiation that they're actually able to divide that energy up and release it as phonons or electronic vibrations to a lattice to to the lattice. So and that's, that's essentially how they convert it into energy that we can use. But we can't use it because in order to use energy like that, right? In order to build a power plant, I have to make steam. That's right. what, you, what I need. So that's how a nuclear reactor works. We 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 have these control we boil rods. water we boil water <laughs> and then they we use that water to push a, a tesla turbine the same yeah, technology yeah, yeah. that tesla invented yep. to so produce that's crazy we right? use the phonons motor. to create piezoelectric uh basically vibrate it until it creates an electrical charge it might be a way to do this with cold fusion where we we create smaller volt the thing is that we there, there's more research that needs to be done into turning this into usable energy because you can build a cold fusion reactor, but if it's cold and it's not boiling water, then you're not going to be able to produce steam. You're not going to be able to build a power plant with but it. But is it? It's literally cold. Isn't it? Can you touch it? Like it's not hot. It's it's just happening. It, cold is, I think, a relative term. I I, I believe it. They electrolyze this, and um, they actually try not to make make it too hot because it will actually fissure the metal and, and have other effects. So, but so it takes place cold, yes, at a much colder temperature than... than so, so, so wait, wait, wait. You're saying that they can do it, but they just can't convert the energy in any meaningful way. That's one like of the biggest problems right out, now. They're like, now what? Yeah, so now we, we've measured, you know, the U.S. Navy uh, Spay War Lab actually measured tritium in their, their cold fusion tests. The guy, Gary, uh, Larry Forsley, and um, I met him at MIT at the, at the conference, too. But these guys have proven that you know fusion's taking place there's some other process that they that it's not well understood that accounts for why we don't see these high energy gammas being produced but then there's the problem of engineering a power plant out of it because how do you you know how do you boil well, it's water producing phonons <laughs> you so boil water <laughs> are the phonons vibrating the lattice where are the phonons going that it's producing yeah, it literally, it's relaxing that um, vibration to and it distributing it to a lattice. So it, it's, oh, it's divided. Um, yeah, it's divided among the lattice. So if we could figure out how to get energy from vibrating palladium, I, I keep thinking of piezoelectric, which is just energy that you get from movement. Um, then maybe we could get, we could have it vibrate. But is it moving? Is it really, it really is it's, moving? It's really strange because it, it occurs at these active sites in the materials. It only occurs like it um, cracks and metal appear to be like a, a active site where these things um, are appearing. And then, you know, there's different researchers on different sites. And one guy's saying, that, no, the cracks are bad and that's, that's not what's going on. And then there's other guys saying that the cracks are good. And it's just like... Palladium's interesting uh, element. It's the only element in the entire periodic table that has its outermost valence shell saturated with electrons. Hmm. So it's like electrically repulsive. So it's probably preventing the gamma radiation. It's pushing. That, that, it's got that, a lot of that, push to it. That explains why why Tony Stark replaced his palladium core, or, or why he had a palladium core in his his uh, his uh, arc reactor. That's exactly exactly very similar yes. to cold fusion in the arc reactor. There's a lot of similarities between the arc reactor and cold fusion. I'm kind of I'm joking, but like, was there is that kind of the 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 inspiration for? I don't believe. I think that came. I think that came before, of course, Pons and Fleischmann. Iron Band is like the '70s, doesn't it? Go back. No, to but I mean, like really. in the modern iterations, he's got palladium in this core 
then it like generates electricity of some sort. I'm sure when Hollywood was redoing that film, they kind of like, they, they, they consult with people like me because I've been approached by people in Hollywood like, look, I'm making a film and I want like some real science to kind of like throw in or, or something and, and mix with this that's realistic and stuff. So that happens. I know that happens. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, but you know, like, I don't know, it's, it's weird, man. So I mean, it's not too far off. too much, but. <laughs> so what, we, we got to build a fusion. How, so, a functioning fusion generator that produces electricity? Yeah, I think these... But then I, I hear these crazy conspiracies that oil barons and, you know, right. the, the tycoons will come after them. Do, do, do you think that's legit? Like, you mentioned before that there are people who don't want the system to change. And I hear a lot... That's actually a very left-wing talking point. The environmentalists, the climate change activists say that it's the big oil companies, their banker buddies, and the politicians who don't want to lose that control over the people. Let, well, let, let, let me, I'll add a little yeah. bit more. The general idea they have is that we as a people are addicted to fossil fuels. We have built this entire civilization upon it over the past hundred plus years. And you, you hear from people like Greta Thunberg, who she says, you know, we, we, we don't want to wait till 2030 or 2022. We want it now. We want a moratorium. And that would mean the, millions would die because yeah. they have no food production. They have no vehicles. And so many on the left think, it's the industrialists doing it on purpose because so long as we're addicted to this, they can say, oh, but we can't get rid of it. You'll die. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's, 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 there's like I've seen so many videos where they're like, I've invented cold fusion or I've invented infinite energy. And they show like magnets on a wheel spinning. and It's like very ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But in a more serious tone, do you think that there's pro there, there may be scientists who have developed some maybe, you know, prominent renewable type energy or clean energy that's being suppressed? I'll mention one, um, you know, you mentioned like perpetual motion machines. I've only seen one in the literature which actually might work, and it's based on Einstein's Brownian motion, and it's, uh, I, I, I But that would, it, that, would, that would mean that more energy is coming out of a system that was put into it. That defies the laws of physics, doesn't it? I sent you a link on it. It's, it's basically like, it's a quantum effect, and it basically, it, it exploits the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in, in some ways, which is kind of like what I talk about with these squeeze states. You're squeezing one of those parameters in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to make the other one go astronomical, so that you can you can change its position or its momentum um, in in space by by focusing one. If you know one, you can only know the position or the momentum of an object to within a degree of h bar over two pi. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So if you know the exact position to to within a finer um, degree of uncertainty than h bar two pi, automatically the the momentum will just go astronomical just because it, it has to conserve this this principle. And the same thing with the momentum. If you know the exact momentum, then suddenly the position changes. So you can never nail down where anything is in quantum mechanics. It, as soon right. as you try to, it moves on you. Have you ever watched uh, Who Killed the Electric Car? It's a yes, documentary. Yes, the EV1 was, and, yeah. and the Saturn. And so I think that's what Tim is kind of pointing at be, with Well, the conspiracy, he pointed out conspiracies. Yeah, there yeah. are conspiracies. Yeah. The General Motors streetcar conspiracy was a legit conspiracy. There used yeah. to be trolley systems connecting the entire United States on the East Coast. I could take a trolley from here to New York and I could pay like a dollar for it. But then they took all the trolleys, they bought out all the trolley systems and pulled all the cars off the, off the rails, disassembled all the rails, all the train tracks, and then no one had any way to get yeah. around, so they had to buy cars. So, you know, I even, I, I, can't get it, I can't even get into the details, but I could vaguely say that I met individuals that, that created, you know, innovations, and they were bought out by big companies, and they were told to shut up, and they did, and they gave them a big fat paycheck. And a lot of these companies that these new advancements would contradict with their market, they just got rid of. Even solar and, panels. Yeah, yeah, and especially when you look at something like you know the the petrodollar and, and its effects on the world stage involving Saudi Arabia. I mean, Saudi Arabia is is an empire in decline already. But if you look at the world going off oil, they're they're a country that that again has a very hard time getting fresh water. Have a, has a very hard time creating any kind of vegetation, any kind of farmland. Uh, Saudi Arabia, some people speculate, might even have a nuclear weapon already. So when we're seeing empires in decline. Um, there's a lot of ramifications for that, and that's why there's been larger theories out there that there is some kind of bigger conspiracy to make sure that we stay on gas, that we stay on oil, rather than, of course, advance towards uh, free energy or free technology or even innovations that are less uh, you know, cost-inducive and don't prop up the Saudi empire. Thanks for checking out this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. We do the show live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. So come back to check us out when we go live. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, hit the notification bell. And we are also available on all podcast platforms for free. If you want to listen to us there, thanks for hanging out and we will see you all next time.